Welcome to Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Rachel Gottbaum. Today, a groundbreaking clinical trial that will change the lives of the growing number of young people and all patients afflicted with this cancer. My name is Awil Da Pena. 2018, I was diagnosed with rectal cancer. I went for colonoscopy and I was told at the colonoscopy the same day that they found a tumor. And the same day, I got an MRI at 7 o'clock at night, I remember. I thought like my world was ending. I'm like, this is it. I was just 38 years old when I was diagnosed. And I met with an oncologist and she gave me treatment options, which she explained the pros and cons of each treatment that we talk about. She told me about the, the, the traditional treatment, the one that they use for years to treat this type of cancer. She also told me about this trial that they were doing at the time. And the first treatment, the traditional one, involves radiation. The trial would not involve radiation. I remember that she specifically asked me if I want to have more children because radiation would affect my uh, reproductive system and there was no reverse back. She said that um, I will have come into menopause at the age of 38. You won't be able to have more children. She even said that it um, be really painful to have sexual intercourse, but those were like the thing that stuck to my head at the, at the time. This um, cancer is like more common in younger people now. And I thought about how bad it will be for a woman that doesn't have any kids, that they want to have kids. How it would affect them. I'm like, at least I have two kids. But then I thought about other women that they might have not any kids, come up with this diagnosis, and then the only option they have is radiation, and that will prevent them from being a mother in the future. So I, I felt really, really, really bad. She told me that a lot of people were in the trial, thousands of people were in the trial, that she was really confident it will work, that the traditional one worked definitely. But this one, it will be a great advance if they could reduce the, the tumor so I could have the surgery and then six more round of chemo after surgery. And then if, if it works, it will be like a great advance in science. It will help a lot, a lot of young women and men in the future. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead with the trial. I knew I was taking a risk because they wasn't sure if it was gonna work on me. It's a trial. There were a lot of people in the trial, but they was not a, like a, a statistic out there of how effective it was. I mean, that's why I, I know what I was taking a risk. But something in me told me like that was the right, the right path. Sometimes you have to take risk for yourself to help others. Maybe it will make a difference in somebody else's life. I contributed to this, you know, and other patients, I mean, could hear my voice and, and know that there was somebody out there that did this trial and is cured now and, and it worked. This is Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Rachel Gottbaum. I'm joined by Dr. Deb Schrag. She's a medical oncologist and chair of the Department of Medicine at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Schrag is the lead author of the PROSPECT study, which found that for many patients with rectal cancer, foregoing radiation can be just as effective in attaining cure as the standard treatment. 
Dr. Schrag, tell us what the standard has been for decades to treat patients with earlier stage rectal cancer. The standard has been long course radiation. And we give some chemotherapy along with that radiation because it helps the radiation work better. Then go to the operating room, have the rectal tumor resected. And then chemotherapy is used in some cases depending on the postoperative findings, what the surgery actually shows. Since 1990, the use of radiation has become standard and is now used worldwide. What has been the effectiveness of this standard of care, radiation, chemo, pre-surgery, surgery, and then maybe some chemo? For the last decade, at least, we've been able to cure upwards of three quarters of patients. So upwards of 75% of patients with locally advanced rectal cancer can expect to be cured with this approach to treatment. So why challenge the idea of radiation? What happened for you and your patients that you thought maybe we should try something different and new? So this really started with patients with advanced rectal cancers, the kind that had already spread. And in that case, radiation didn't make sense. So we started with chemotherapy and we saw these terrific responses to chemotherapy. And we said, maybe we can get away and treat these tumors effectively with chemotherapy regimens without universal application of radiation. The other thing that happened is we had an increasing epidemic of early onset rectal cancer. That is rectal cancers diagnosed in individuals under the age of 50, but even under the age of 40 and under the age of 30. And for these patients, particularly women, radiation was problematic really for a couple of reasons. But the main one was fertility. Once you've radiated the uterus, it is no longer able to sustain a pregnancy. Pelvic radiation can also precipitate early ovarian failure and having women enter menopause early. And that's certainly not a welcome event if you're a woman in her 30s or 40s. Of course, it's not just women. Radiation can also have long-term adverse effects on sexual function and bowel function. It has a number of side effects, which would be nice to avoid if possible. So you're saying, Dr. Schrag, that you had this hunch a while ago. Why don't you explain the goal of this study and how it worked? So we had this hunch, and along with some colleagues, we tested it. We did a small pilot trial, and it was a trial of about 30 patients, and we tried the alternative. We tried starting with chemotherapy and reserving the radiation only if those rectal tumors didn't respond well to the chemotherapy. And then they were able to go on and have rectal surgery. And nearly all of our patients responded and did extremely well, and we were able to cure them simply with the chemotherapy. And we said, huh, maybe we're onto something. So tell us about this bigger study and why It was so challenging and controversial. So we have an approach that's tried and true, chemoradiation, that achieves a cure rate in a very high proportion of patients. It takes a lot of courage on the part of patients to not receive something and receive an alternative that may or may not achieve a comparable result. We did eliminate some high-risk groups of patients because some physicians were too concerned that we might be jeopardizing the potential for cure. Particularly older physicians certainly remember the days in the 1970s and 1980s when patients with rectal cancer had local pelvic recurrences and having chronic pelvic pain. These were patients who could not sit down in the waiting room. You just could look at people's faces and see the suffering. I've been a physician for long enough so that I've treated local pelvic recurrences. I can tell you that it is miserable and any physician who's taking care of a patient with a bad locally recurrent rectal cancer, it is not an experience that they would wish on anyone. They are just very hard to treat. So 
physicians who had that experience understand how important it is to minimize the risk of that. And the concern is that by omitting radiation, some patients might end up with a local recurrence and more suffering. So that was the fear and concern. But it's hard to execute randomized trials. It's hard to accept that essentially a flip of a coin, or these days it's a computer, will decide on which treatment you're getting. But we had brave patients and their physicians who were courageous enough and understood the importance of this question. So tell us in a nutshell how the trial worked exactly. So um, the trial randomized patients. Half the patients in the study received the standard treatment, which was chemotherapy and radiation for five and a half weeks, a recovery period, surgery. And then they and their physicians decided if chemotherapy was indicated based on the pathology report from the operation. That was the tried and true method. The other half of patients had six treatments of chemotherapy. And when that treatment was complete, they had a second MRI of the pelvis. If that MRI showed that the tumor was shrinking by at least 20%, so the tumor was responding nicely to that chemotherapy, they recovered and went to the operating room directly without receiving any radiation. If the MRI showed that the tumor wasn't responding nicely, they got, if you will, a second crack at the apple and got the radiation preoperatively. And the outcome? The outcome of the study at five years, when we looked at how many patients had survived without the cancer coming back, results were essentially identical in both groups of patients. There was a one percentage point difference that actually favored the chemotherapy alone group. We have disease-free survival at five years and results are identical. We also have overall survival results at five years and results are identical. We also have the local recurrence rates at five years and remarkably, it's 2% in both groups. It's tiny. So what does this mean now for clinicians and their patients moving forward? So put very simply, it means that patients have a choice. That's what we're proud of. So we showed that using chemotherapy to treat this group of patients, and this is a group at intermediate or average risk, very commonly encountered group, that this group of patients, we can achieve the same outcomes, whether we use radiation or whether we use chemotherapy. For example, patients for whom preservation of fertility is very important might be more likely to opt for the chemotherapy only approach. But whenever patients have options, it's a good thing. Patients and their physicians will sort this through and figure out the best approach. I think I should also say it's critically important that when it takes 10 years to conduct a trial, the good thing is that the world keeps on spinning and progress continues. So I am very proud that while we were conducting this trial and answering this question, other questions have been asked. So while we were doing Prospect, my colleagues did pilot trials trying to see whether instead of eliminating the radiation, could we eliminate the surgery? And the answer is maybe we can. That randomized trial hasn't been published yet. So I think what we're learning is there are treatment alternatives that patients have options. In our study, in the PROSPECT trial, we showed that chemotherapy is a safe substitute for chemoradiation for this group of average risk patients. But other studies that are in process now and going forward may show us that there's an alternative to the surgery. Why was it so important to you as a clinician to do this study? At the time that I started this study, I was treating a larger number of young patients. And although it's so gratifying to help people achieve cure, it was not lost upon me that there were consequences of our treatment 
So it was just very gratifying to try to think about people going on to lead long, healthy lives with optimal function. So not just alive, but also functioning well. Because we weren't sure what patient preferences would look like and what the patient experience would be, we actually integrated into this trial a symptom monitoring program. We asked patients directly to tell us what their symptoms were. There will be a companion manuscript published, and that describes the patient-reported outcomes in this trial, where patients told us exactly how they felt. If we have patients who want to know about specific symptoms, bowel function, sexual function, urinary function, we have those data, and they're described in that paper. Would you say that your drive to get this study done and this accompanying survey from patients marks a turning point in how we are looking at what we need to do about standards of of treatment, how they might evolve, and quality of life issues? I would say that there has been a shift. And now when we design clinical trials in cancer medicine, we pay a great deal of attention to not just traditional endpoints like survival and recurrence, but we also pay a lot of attention to patients' well-being and function during the treatment, but also long-term. My research career uh, mentor, a woman named Dr. Jane Weeks, who's now deceased, was a pioneer in the field. And I remember her saying to me again and again, we have to not just cure people, we also have to focus on the quality of their life. That theme has really been built. It's been supported by investigators around the United States and globally around the world. And we do a much better job than we used to of engaging patients as partners in our research, helping us design our trials, execute them, tell us what's really happening. We did that in Prospect. I think it's it's become quite standard. It's particularly standard in trials sponsored by the National Cancer Institute and that are supported by taxpayer dollars. And it's been really just such a privilege to be part of that transition in how we do cancer clinical trials. Dr. Schrag, thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you. I hope I gave you what you needed. Dr. Deb Schrag is a medical oncologist, and she's also chair of medicine at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. This is Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. Next time, using gene editing in novel ways to cure disease and provide access to life-saving cells. We can now start to tackle really hard questions or really difficult to treat tumors in a way that we just couldn't do before. That's next time on Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Rachel Gottbaum.